Uh, welcome to uh, the Living Room at the Goldman School of Public Policy. It's great to have you here today, Congressman Frank, and Alex Gelber, who's a member of the faculty at the Goldman School of Public Policy and also uh, served in the Obama administration. So we have uh, people here with uh, strong intellectual backgrounds, actually in both cases, and also have had a lot of experience uh, with government. So we want to talk some about government in the United States right now in Washington, and especially talk about financial services. We're going to focus a lot on the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, but before we do that, uh, of all the things you did other than Dodd-Frank, what's your proudest accomplishment while you were in Washington? Well, I, I, I always hate to kind of, you know, talk about all the good stuff. Um, cumulatively, I uh, am, am proud of the work I was able to do with others to advance the cause of equal legal treatment for LGBT people. Uh, for example, when I got to Congress, uh, I was focused in part on the fact that on the books of the United States at the time, 1980, was a law that made it uh, technically illegal for a, a gay or lesbian person even to come to the United States as a visitor. The law flatly uh, rejected it. It wasn't always enforced or even often, but it was occasionally used to harass people. And uh, I really took the lead in getting, getting that one abolished. Um, the, uh, the most important impact I've had in, in, in uh, the economic area over time, I was able to do more for rental housing for low-income people than would have happened otherwise. Never got, I never got as far as I wanted to, but uh, I, I thought rental housing for low-income people is a very important social resource that uh, it's kind of underappreciated and overlooked. Absolutely. Did you feel that it took a lot of courage to take the positions you took with respect to being gay and gay rights and so forth? Or was it, in some sense, ultimately just a necessity given who, who you yeah, were? Yeah, well, it didn't take any courage to be gay. Uh, yeah. Of course, I was. So <laughs> um, uh, no alternative ever presented itself as, a, as an option. Um, it did, I thought in 1987, to be honest, that I was showing courage by coming out, and I guess that's implicit in the fact that I was the first member of Congress uh, to come out voluntarily. Only one of my colleagues had been outed before, um, and it wasn't the only one, so I suppose that showed some problem. But it turned out that I, uh, what I did may have been subjectively courageous, but not objectively. That is, it turned out that the country was readier for it than I thought. Uh, but I, I was frightened, and yeah, it did take some, I was taking some risk. Uh, it turned out to be uh, not much of one. Mm -hmm. And in fact, are you surprised at where we are today, how fast this is moving? Oh, without question. Um, I introduced a piece of legislation in 1972 for the first time in Massachusetts. Uh, for gay rights, and it was overwhelmingly defeated in Massachusetts. I think the first vote was something like 200 to 20. And um, I've seen things get better, but, but I, I've, I've continually been surprised by the speed. And, you know, even 10 years ago, if you had told me that uh, uh, I was going to get married as a member of Congress to, to the man I loved, I would have said, well, look, we're making progress, but that's a little far-fetched. And then in the end, someone did ask me uh, recently, well, when, when you married your husband and you were still a member of Congress, uh, was that controversial? And I said, actually, it caused a great deal of controversy, mainly from uh, some of my colleagues who were angry that they hadn't been invited. <laughs> You've also been an advocate for abortion rights, but the, ta the, the way those two issues have developed has been quite different. Abortion rights is still very controversial. It looks like, if anything, there's some evidence that younger people today are a little more conservative than they were 30 or 40 years ago. 
uh, whereas on gay rights, there's just no question that younger people are a lot more liberal on gay rights than young people 20 or 30 years ago, and it looks like that's going to be a permanent change. Yeah, no, they, well, tell me what the difference is. Well, why, why did gay rights get such traction? There are, there are real differences. Look, I, I am very much in favor of women being able to have abortions on, on their own terms and their own decision, but it is, it is a tougher decision. I mean, I guess the best way to put it is this. Uh, these days, in the absence of prejudice, I don't know many people who uh, are, are, are consider being gay uh, an occasion for sadness. On the other hand, I don't know many women who are really kind of happy to have had abortions. I mean, there is, there is this difference. Being gay is a, a fact of life for people. It doesn't have any impact on anybody else. With regard to abortion, there is a potential life involved. And uh, that, that, I think, is the, uh, is, is the difference. Um, it is also clearly the case that uh, people feel religiously much more profoundly uh, on, the, on the abortion issue than the gay rights issue. And then there's also this factor is that uh, we have experience going for us. People have seen gay people, and that's a factor. But, but you don't have any comparable with regard to abortion. I, I guess the way to put it is this. People have this prejudice against gay and lesbian people that's uh, dissolved by the, our reality. They come and meet us, but they are very unhappy about abortion. They never have any experience that they, they encounter that makes them change that. Right. Yeah, I think abortion's a much tougher issue is what it really comes down to. Let me turn to Professor Gelber. You were in the Obama administration, I guess, when Dodd-Frank was passed. After Dodd-Frank was passed, right after two years. Yeah. So what, what do you think the biggest accomplishment of Dodd-Frank was? What would you say is the biggest thing it did, and how did it most uh, greatly change uh, people's thinking about the financial industries? To be honest, I don't think there was one accomplishment of Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank did so many different things, and I'm sure that Congressman Frank can speak <laughs> uh, can speak uh, quite a bit to, uh, to to what it did. I can speak to my personal experience with what I where I intersected with it the most. Um, I worked a bit with this Financial Stability Oversight Council um, on identifying threats to financial stability. Um, especially prior to the fiscal cliff, which was a major, you know, threat to financial stability, threatened to um, to reduce U.S. GDP by about five. So this is an organization um, that's the job is to try to sort of monitor the amount of instability or stability in the economy and make almost predictions about if bad things are going to happen and make sure that we don't have bad things happen because we're more aware of what's going on. Is that a right way to describe it? Yes, trying to identify threats to financial stability and uh, identify, you know, discuss regulations, recommend regulations that will, uh, and, uh, and policies that will address those, those and threats. And is it doing that? Is it successful? I think it is. I think it has been successful, absolutely, yeah. And certainly what I observed um, was, a, was a very serious, uh, very concerted effort to identify, you know, very serious threats in, a, in an effective way. And Congressman Frank, do you think it's doing what it's supposed to do? Absolutely, and I'm, I'm glad that Professor Gilbert mentioned that because it gives me a chance to respond to one of the, I think, less informed criticisms or, or concerns. People have said, well, okay, but is this just not a case of you solve the problems that we had, but what does this say about problems for the future? And we were very c conscious in the bill of the importance of doing both, namely fixing abuses that we had seen and, and, and plugging holes that we had seen, but also giving the regulators the capacity to be forward-looking. And the Financial Stability Oversight Council was a key to that, and, and the fact that it's a council, it is a council made up of all of the important financial regulators. And the problem previously had been that each regulator has, of necessity, its defined responsibility. And some of the problems have been in the interstices, some of the problems don't neatly fit into one place or another. So by setting up this council of all the organizations working together and charging them with this mandate, as Professor Galba said, to, to, to watch out for what's going on, we have installed the capacity not just to fix the past problems, but to respond if something becomes a problem in the future. So maybe we've got a chance to figure out when we've got problems with securitized mortgages in the future or derivatives or whatever else. Is that right, Professor Gelber? Do you think we've got that kind of capacity with that? I think it's, I think it's much improved and certainly what I saw on a day-to-day -day basis was an enormous amount of effort by very talented and 
uh, by very talented and serious people to try to address uh, whatever threats uh, looked like you know might be looming on the horizon. And do you think they had enough imagination to imagine? I mean, part of the problem here is <laughs> it seems like reality gets ahead of our imagination, and we don't recognize that things that look relatively harmless suddenly become really harmful. Yeah. Um, Certainly that's been alleged with respect to the financial crisis. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, I remember talking to someone in preparation for a big meeting, just going back to the example of the fiscal cliff, um, talking to someone from who was working with the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, um, who really pressed me on, you know, uh, is it really likely that we're going to solve this problem? Is it really likely that we're going to extend the provisions of the tax code and of spe uh, you know of spending that historically have been extended so many times in the past it's just an assumption that that's going to continue to get extended but is that really true and so I think that there was um, not only uh, imagination but there was close scrutiny of even uh, you know risks that are that are qu you know quite unlikely but still important to scrutinize because of their potential uh, destabil you know destabilization of the economy so, Congressman Frank, last night you were talking about the military budget, which of course is meant to deal with wars and warfare in the, in the world, and uh, unfortunately the human condition seems to be that wars do occur and terrible things happen. Is it the human condition that terrible things like financial crises happen, or and can we never really get away from them, or do you think we can ameliorate them? Oh, I think we them, can. What can we, can we do? We can, we can do two things that I think we did in the bill. We can reduce the likelihood of their occurring, although we can't wipe them out altogether, and we can diminish the impact that they will have negative when they do occur. And I, again, uh, appreciate Professor Gilbert mentioning the, uh, the, the situation, uh, what we did with the council. Uh, one other, two other points I would make explicit. Uh, first of all, you often hear criticism of any entity, any large organization, whether it's a, uh, a private corporation that's very large, a government, a university, it is that people don't talk to each other that each, uh, there are segments that have their own responsibility and they don't cooperate. And that's a, uh, that's a real danger. If you're the head of the Securities Exchange Commission or the control of the currency, you have your day-to-day -day responsibilities. You, you don't, in the normal course of events, have a lot of time to think about talking to the other regulators. Well, the Financial Stability Oversight Council institutionalizes their talking to each other and, and, and sharing information, and as they do, and they are served by another important institution called the Office of Financial Responsibility, which is their research arm, which does not have operational responsibilities, but is there to watch what's going on. And for example, there can be activities which individually aren't all that harmful, but it turns out if you're looking at several of them, they can accumulate to be harmful. In, in some ways, uh, you have too much risk taking, too many financial decisions that in the abstract themselves are okay, if they all cluster in one way, they can cause a problem. It's kind of like everybody rushing to the side of a small boat, and that can cause you problems. And, and so I think as a result of this, as I said, we, it will be much less likely that we'll have this kind of a crisis, although, yeah, there'll be problems, and uh, the, the, the negative impact will be uh, diminished. So of the things you did that sort of were backward looking in the sense they were in a attempt to look at why we got into the trouble we got into 2008, maybe even earlier. Which of those things is, do you think is most important in preventing future financial crises? Is it the local well, rule? Is it the regulation of credit agency, of, of uh, credit uh, rating agencies? Which, which could, ones? The most direct cause were people getting mortgages that they shouldn't have gotten. Mm -hmm. And we have improved that, although it's the one area where I'm a little bit unhappy with what the regulators did. We just flat out outlawed the kind of mortgages that were almost destined to go bad. And we created this independent consumer bureau to, to enforce that. Um, we also mandated that there be risk retention, namely that people who package these mortgages and sell them be responsible for the first 5% of the losses. The problem was with the whole notion of instead of the borrower paying back the person who lent them the money so that the lender is carefully checking that borrower, those loans are sold in, in, into the ether, and, and nobody has the responsibility in this chain for checking. So we thought, well, give people the, the threat of loss. There's nothing like the threat of loss to, to concentrate them. The regulators were afraid, I'm told, that uh, uh, 
the mortgage, uh, the, the, the giving of mortgages was tightened up, so they refused to impose that, which they had some discretion under the law. I'm hoping that will, that will come back. Um, the other thing we did was the, the proximate cause of this were the uh, use of financial derivatives, and in particular, people engaging in these financial transactions where huge amounts of money were at stake, but with no financial backing. That is, people were making bets. Derivatives are a form of a bet, and that's fine in the system, except that it, the system allowed people to make these enormous bets with no money to back it up, so that when the bets went wrong, as they will, because they are bets, the, the people who made the bets couldn't pay off. And when they couldn't pay off, the people who they owed money to couldn't pay their debtors, et cetera. And we, uh, in fact, I was interested to see today, there was an article yesterday uh, in the New York Times about uh, Citicorp, and they are, in fact, bigger in derivatives than people thought, but they did note that even Citicorp is doing most of its derivative, derivative changing, derivative trading on exchanges. And by definition, that means that they're gonna, that there's no uh, ability, as AIG did, to incur enormous debt and not be able to pay it off. So criticisms sometimes of the American financial system have been that unlike Canada, for example, where they have very high reserve requirements, which means you've got to have a lot of money and you can't leverage it so much, that our system allows a lot more leveraging of assets. Do you think that Dodd-Frank has reduced, and then I'm going to come to the other side, by the way, for people who criticize this as not allowing enough leveraging. So the, you're sort of betwixt and between here. Some people say, no, no, it's really great we can leverage things a lot because that means we can have very uh, adventuresome and exciting financial institutions. But on the other hand, that might lead to crashes and so forth. Did you reach the right balance? I think we have, although it's, the, the beauty of that is that we don't have to hit a spot and stick with it. Uh, that part of that is, is affected by requiring the institutions to keep amounts of capital on hand. And uh, regulators set that now, but they can go up or down. If it turns out they've asked for too much capital and that means loans aren't being made, they can reduce it or vice versa. So uh, we have substantially reduced leverage in two ways. First, as I said, with regard to the trading and derivatives, um, AIG came to the federal government, the Bush administration, in September 2008 and said we're $85 billion short of paying off on the bets we made in the derivative area. That is, we were so leveraged that we can't pay up. A week later, they came back and said, oh, by the way, we were wrong when we told you we were $85 billion short. We were $170 billion short. And, and that really precipitated the situation. That couldn't happen again, because no one could, under the law today, get so indebted without having the requirement to put up the money. So between that, deleveraging in derivatives and the higher capital reserves that banks have to have. Uh, it's very important. By the way, Canada, though, is relevant in one other way that to anticipate another criticism we get this time from people mostly on the left. It is that the banks are still too big and that we have to break them up. Well, in fact, Canada has a very small number of very big banks. And, 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 and you cannot make the argument that bigness in banks is inherently the problem unless you do a lot of explaining about Canada. So. Why did Canada, though, not have such a serious financial Because they did collapse. have a much more thoughtful set of rules about diminishing leverage and, and requiring high capital, et cetera. So higher reserve requirements. You had to have money to back up what you were doing and so forth. What do you think about other things like regulating credit rating agencies and trying to expand the set of institutions that were going to be covered? It does, does Dodd-Frank go far enough? Is it imaginative enough to thinking about what I was frustrated. We could not think of ways really to deal with the credit rating agencies. The central problem at the core of credit rating agencies, the agencies that are paid to tell investors whether a particular security is, a, is risky or not. And the problem is that the people who pay them to assess how risky the securities are are the people who are selling the securities and who have an interest in people thinking they are not risky. And the problem is that... It, it is very hard to replace that model. The obvious theoretical way is to say, okay, instead we'll have the rating agencies be paid by the people who are gonna buy them. But the people who are gonna buy them don't know who they are. I mean, that's, that's the end of the process. And uh, so my own view about rating agencies now is to urge people not to pay any attention to them, uh, at least not to the point where they rely on them to the exclusion of their own efforts. I, I, I do, I, nobody's yet suggested to me a way to solve that fundamental conflict. Professor Gilbert, where do people go to get information, though, if they can't trust the credit rating agencies? What, what do you do? 
Um, well, I think the financial markets scrutinize banks' balance sheets and scrutinize, you know, the the statements that 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 they make extensively. Um, I do think that there is a problem with the credit with with the credit rating agencies, um, and uh, it's as as Congressman Frank, Frank said, it's difficult to know what to to do about it, practically speaking. Do you feel like you feel good about where the Balance lies in terms of regulation now. You took some away from the Federal Reserve. You uh, assigned different responsibilities. There's a big debate over who should have those responsibilities. How did it come out, and do you feel good about it? Mostly, um, the Federal Reserve lost more than anybody else because, counterintuitively, before we passed the law, the Federal Reserve exercised most of the powers for protecting consumers. Now, I've known a lot of people in the Federal Reserve. They are very nice people, they, uh, they would be good neighbors, but their fundamental charge is to protect the solvency of the banks. And uh, worrying about fairness of the bank's customers is just never going to be top of their list. So taking all those consumer powers away and putting in the consumer bureau was a good idea. Um, the other thing we did was, as Professor Gulper said at the beginning, was to set up the Oversight Council so they have to talk to each other. There is one fundamental irrationality in our law that there was just no way to change because of American economic and cultural history. Securities, and particularly derivatives, are now regulated both by the Securities and Exchange Commission and by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. The latter was set up to deal with agriculture, it was commodities, uh, the former, the SEC, for the financial markets. If you try to merge them now, you would have the agricultural interests in the country, which are still very largely represented in the Senate in particular by the two state senators per state, go berserk. So there was a confusion and an overlap there. I give credit in the last few years to the people in both agencies, because they've worked very hard to come together. But, but, but that's a potential trouble spot, and I don't know how we deal with it. Professor Gobble, tell me about the liquidation uh, provision. That says that there's a way that financial institutions can be liquidated if they sort of get in trouble. Where does that stand? Is that something that really is going to be used or is it something that's just there in theory? Well, hopefully it doesn't have to be used, but, um, but you know, one day it's, it's possible that there will come a point that we'll have to. Um, uh, institutions are now required to submit living wills, um, you know, which, which specify how uh, they'll be uh, liquidated, and there's something called orderly liquidation authority in, in Dodd Frank, which um, which allows liquidation. Um, so I think that Dodd Frank made huge steps forward in terms of uh, in, in terms of doing that. And there's something called you know single point of entry that allows uh, allows that that liquidation uh, to occur, uh, you know, of the holding company. Uh, so uh, so. There, there have been tremendous steps, I think, made uh, recently in terms of... Let's talk about the political thing. So we get into a situation where we have a Bear Stearns in trouble or something like that. Will it make it easier to liquidate a Bear Stearns or deal with something like that or Lehman Brothers or whatever? I mean, or is it still going to be a situation where political decision making will be incredibly hard because it's not clear what the reactions of the markets will be and of the general population and so forth? I don't want to minimize the problems that there would be in the event of, um, you know, liquidation of a major financial institution. I think that it would still be, you know, disruptive to the financial markets, and that's an inevitable feature of uh, the liquidation of a major financial institution, no matter what regulators could could do. Um, but I do think that uh, that having a plan in place in advance mm -hmm. and having the regulations in place in advance that allow that to proceed in a, an orderly way, as, as it's called in the, in the regulations themselves, um, will uh, calm the financial markets, I think, because it'll be clearer how the process is going to unfold. Um, I also think that it'll reduce the risk of contagion um, in the sense that, uh, you know, if you're more confident that uh, there's going to be orderly liquidation of one institution, it's less likely that you know that's going to spread in a sort of panic across institutions like we saw in the financial crisis. Um, so I think that the the prospects are much improved, but that there's inevitably going to be some degree of uh, of um, of instability that it causes. What's your take on that? Is that uh, he's absolutely right? And there are three very specific statutory differences 
between what was then and is now. And much of it, by the way, and I know the current Republican, very conservative approach is to denigrate all this, but particularly with regard to orderly liquidation, the impetus for much of it came from the Bush administration, particularly from former Secretary of the Treasury Henry Paulson and uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve Ben Bernanke, although he stayed on into uh, President Obama, he was a Bush guy, a Bush appointee. And uh, here was the problem they presented to us. Under the law, as they were advised by their lawyers, uh, when Lehman Brothers came forward and could not pay its debts, with regard to Bear Stearns, with regard to Merrill Lynch, they were able to get existing banks to take over. But by the time Lehman Brothers came, we were out of banks. Uh, that a Citicorp was weak itself, Bank of America had taken on Merrill Lynch, J.P. Morgan Chase had taken on Bear Stearns, um, uh, Wells Fargo had taken on Wachovia. There was nobody left to take them in. So they had to deal with this, and they had two choices, they were told, under the law. They could either let the company go bankrupt and none of the debts could get paid with any federal assistance, or they could give them money to keep them from going bankrupt. That's what they did with AIG. They, they, they had no option, and they said, here's the option we need. We need to be able to let the company go under but have the capacity to pay some of the debts and not all of the debts. With Lehman Brothers, they paid none of the debts. That froze the market. So with AIG, they paid all of the debts and that got everybody angry. And so we first of all said, Including okay. Including the guy who was the head of AIG, apparently. Well, yes, he, he, <laughs> he, well, he was the founder. He was not founder. there at the moment, but yeah, Mr. Greenberg, who was the prime uh, shareholder, he has now incredibly sued the federal government uh, after his company needed $170 billion of bailout to keep, uh, and, and the company was kept alive, um, I have characterized Mr. Greenberg, who sued the federal government because he thought he was treated unfairly, as the arsonist who was suing the fire department for water damage. Um, <laughs> but um, now the federal government can pick and choose. They can, they can pay only as many of the debts as are needed to keep excessive contagion. Secondly, very important, they don't have to choose between letting it go totally bankrupt and pay nothing and keeping it alive. As a matter of fact, a condition of paying some of the debts and stabilizing the situation is to put it out of business, but to do it in the single point of entry in, in, a, in an orderly way. That's why it's orderly liquidation. So that the federal government takes it over, it puts other people in charge, and it, can, it pays only as many of the debts as it has to. And this is the final point. If it turns out there's not enough in the company itself to pay those debts, generally there wouldn't be, or they wouldn't be going under, the federal treasury will advance money to pay some of those debts, but the secretary of the treasury is mandated under law immediately to recover any outlay that comes from the treasury from financial institutions with $50 billion and more. So there's no more too big to fail, as it said. If you can't pay your debts, you fail. You're out of business. The federal government then steps in and pays only as much of the debt as it has to do to keep the things from getting out of control. And what it does pay is then recovered from other financial institutions. And the rationale for that is this. All financial institutions, large ones, benefit from the knowledge that that's there. Again, as Professor Gelber noted, it is stabilizing when other entities know that this is in place. So because all of them benefit from the fact that the investing community knows it's there, it's fair to tax all of them to keep it going. So what Congressman Frank's talking about is that the bill presumably reduces uncertainty on the part of financial institutions. They have a more clear picture of what's going to happen. And of course, uncertainty is something that's a big topic in finance and among economists. Does that ring true to you, that this is the kind of institutional measures we need to take to reduce uncertainty and to maybe create more stability? Yes, I think in the long run, uh, it will reduce the risk of, of, I mean, this in combination with many, many other measures in Dodd-Frank will reduce the risk of, you know, catastrophic financial collapse in the United States. Um, and that it does reduce substantially the risk of, I mean, of, of sort of left tail outcomes, of really negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, there's still, you know, not to, you know, not to minimize, there are still a lot of risks out there and the market day to day 
isn't typically reacting to the very negative left tail risks. I mean, we've seen history show us that it does happen. You know, it has happened historically in the United States and around the world every several decades or more frequently. Um, so it's it's not a, a um, trivial risk. It's extremely important for financial history and and so on. But um, but uh, but yes, I, I do think it would r reduce the risk. Most of, economists would agree with that. And I think most economists would agree with that, yes. And the, and the, the market is agreeing with the two of you. Uh, you know, one thing I do want to say, we get accused of uh, those of us who passed the legislation and people in the administration that, that we intruded in the market, so we unsettled the market. Um, we began, we had a press conference under Speaker Pelosi, myself and some members of our committee, to announce what we were going to do on March 9th, 2009. Uh, the day we announced it, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 6,500. It is now almost tripled, even with the last drop. It's still about 280 percent ahead. Uh, when the market has gone up 280 percent in this short period, I, I, I don't feel too guilty that we inflicted great damage. The other point I wanted to make, and uh, what what we have to say is, these provisions work together. You asked us correctly, and we've responded about what what we do if there is a uh, a failure, and the federal government has to step in and deal with this large debt. But we also have put provisions in there to make it less likely that there will be such a large debt. And again, I take AIG as the example, which, which was the trigger. Um, not only do we have a better way of dealing with an AIG, which is so deeply indebted, we have taken steps to make it much less likely that it will be that deeply indebted, because they got in that hole by selling credit to fault swaps, that is, promising selling insurance to other people. If you buy a risky security and it doesn't pay off, we'll make up your loss, which is called a credit default swap. And um, what we've done is to prevent an AIG or anybody else from, in fact, obligating themselves to pay money without putting money aside to do it. So, and, and then to go back a step further, all of this began, they needed to pay off the credit default swaps because these securities had defaulted because a lot of mortgages had been sold that shouldn't have been sold. So we make it much less likely that bad mortgages will be sold, and we then make it much less likely that people will promise to insure against them without having the money, and then finally there's liquidation if all else fails. Tell me a little bit about what it felt like when you approached this subject as chair of the Financial Services Committee. Was there a piecemeal approach, a piecemeal approach that was possible, but you decided instead to do the omnibus approach? Because this is an extraordinary bill with many, many, many different chapters and sections. Uh, and was there a chance that this could end up as just a little pieces of things well, instead of this enormous piece oh, very of very good question. Uh, we had always assumed that we would have this scope of legislation, although at the beginning there was one very important piece that was not inherent in this, and I'm very proud of that. That's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, although, uh, you know, had there been one, it could have helped avoid things because it would have stopped the bad mortgages from being made. So we, but and everything else, no, it, it was clearly within the scope, but your question is a good one because my initial approach was that we in the House, would, which, where this was going to begin, would pass seven or eight separate bills on each topic. And the reason we didn't was very simple. Senator Dodd, a very able guy, I was uh, privileged to be able to work with him, said, look, it is hard enough to get the United States Senate to adopt one controversial bill. No way am I going to try and get them to do eight. So the decision to put it all into one bill was based on the impossibility, the, the, the difficulty of passing bills uh, in the Senate. I do want to respond, though. There are people who mock the bill. It's got too many pages. And one of the things that they do is they compare it to the uh, Glass-Steagall Act in the New Deal, which had 35 pages and we have 900 pages. Um, I just wrote to uh, uh, Martin Wolf, who's a brilliant and thoughtful writer who wrote a very good book recently about the crisis. Among other things, I was pleased because he refutes the right-wing arguments that this is all the fault of liberals trying to give poor people houses. But he made this comparison, and I wrote him a letter, and I said, well, here's the point. We didn't just do what Glass-Steagall did. We passed legislation that was the equivalent of the Securities and Exchange Act and the Securities Act and the uh, Investment Company Act and the Homeowners Loan Corporation. I mean, if you look at what we did, it was the equivalent of seven or eight pieces of legislation in the New Deal. And again, the, the sole reason for doing them separately was that uh, you, could, it, you couldn't get all of them through in the Senate in any reasonable amount of time. Breaking eight filibusters 
would have been impossible. So, so tell me a little more about the architecture or the mechanisms by which you get this all together and, and any points at which you just wondered whether it was ever going to come to fruition. The, the, way, the way we did it in the house, which, which, which I chaired, we treated it as separate bills until we came to the floor. That is what, what we have in the house, the sessions in which the bills are actually amended and voted on, they're called markups, because literally what happens is people sit there with copies of the bill, which have triple spaces and, and line numbers, and you physically, oh, I moved to amend it, and you, you just sort of write it in. So we had something like seven or eight separate committee sessions to vote on the bills. Uh, and as we reported each bill out, it was held as a separate bill. And then in the House Rules Committee, which does it, it was all put together. So up until it went to the floor of the House, these bills were considered in the House separately. When it got to the Senate, Senator Dodd was then going to have a series of sessions on that bill in his committee. And at that point, the Republican leadership informed him that they hated the whole idea of regulation. They were just going to vote no no matter what. They weren't going to participate. If, if, if he called the committee meeting, which he had, to vote to send the bill to the floor of the Senate, they would just sit there and vote no. So the Senate, uh, we had about, I don't know, seven or eight markups, as I said, that probably accumulated uh, uh, 60 or 70 hours. Uh, the Senate did it in about 15 minutes because the Republicans declined to participate. And then what happened? Well, then we had, <laughs> I'm very proud of, of uh, it, the Senate passed the bill the first time, but then we had um, a House Senate conference. House, House Senate conference is a peculiarity of the American constitutional system because we are one of the few parliaments, there may be one or two others, I just say a few rather than none because I want to cover myself. But most democratic societies, the single one chamber beats the other. The House of Commons dominates the House of Lords. In Germany, it's generally the lower house that wins. In America, you have to have legislation passed in absolutely exact, word for word, otherwise you don't have to understand the bill, in both houses. So for years, we had this process of the House and the Senate together, coming together in a conference. So many senators, so many representatives, and you sit there and you negotiate, and it's a fascinating process for political science because there is no mechanism for resolving disputes. If uh, all the representatives say one thing and all the senators say another, you just sit there until somebody gives in. And they had not been having those for a while. And there was also concern that there wasn't enough openness, that we were doing these things in secret. So I announced, because it was my turn to be the head of the conference, that we would have an open conference. So for two weeks, literally two full weeks, uh, five days a week, we sat in first the House and then the Senate and took up that bill piece by piece. There was the Senate version, the House version, and, and, and uh, had to hammer it out, again, with virtually no Republican participation because they were going to vote against everything. But uh, the Senator Dodd and the other Democratic senators, myself and the other Democratic representatives, just put it together piece by piece, and I'm very proud of it. We were on C-SPAN, and uh, for two weeks, we just sat there and did it. And you think that was a really important piece of making sure that something happened? Yeah, uh, because it, it uh, there were criticisms. But if we hadn't done that, I guarantee you the air would be full of conspiracy theories about all these secret deals, et cetera. So this is a case where you do something, we all do this in human life, sometimes you do things not because it's going to benefit you to do them, but it's going to cause you great pain if you don't do them. So you do them to break even. So there are any moments when you despaired that you just thought, this isn't going to work and, and it, I just can't make this happen? Or what did it all feel like all the time that you're A couple of times progress? I was worried about pieces of it. Um, the, the financial institutions made a big fresh push to try and weaken the Consumer Bureau. Uh, there was a critical, obscure issue um, under the Bush administration when many states tried to regulate banks' mortgage practices. They issued what's called a preemption, whereby the federal government said that no state could regulate mortgage practices. This was one Further example of the conservatives, in effect, saying you couldn't block subprime mortgages. And the banks hated that, and, and we had a major legislative fight over that. And I was afraid we might have lost that, which would have severely hampered our ability to go forward to protect uh, consumers. Uh, but it worked. The, the, the other problem was in the Senate. They needed 60 votes. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the Democratic senators, Senator Feingold, decided that it wasn't perfect enough, and he only voted for perfect, even though he said this was much better than the status quo. Said he was going to vote no. Elizabeth Warren tried to get him to change his mind. He wouldn't do it. So it came down to three Republican senators. We, we didn't have enough Democrats. We had almost enough. We needed the votes of, uh, I think, one or two Republican senators, but there were three more moderate Republicans from New England, Senator Brown from Massachusetts and Senator Snow and Collins from Maine. They basically decided they were going to vote that way together. So we had some uh, hairy negotiations. One day towards the end when we were, we were ready to uh, bring the bill to, the, to, to go to conference and needed to have the 60 Senate votes, I got an emergency phone call. I was in the House gym, and it was uh, Senator Dodd, Senator John Kerry, and Senator Harry Reid, the leader. And they said, Scott Brown's got a problem. You, we got to work it out. I had to go in my gym clothes over to my office and, and, and have some last minute negotiations. And then the other one was after we actually voted the bill out, the Congressional Budget Office told us it was going to cost $20 billion to do everything we wanted over a 10 year period. Ironically, they said, look, it's going to cost $20 billion over the first 10 years. It will make money in the second 10 years, but you can't count that under the stupid rules we have for the budget that we imposed on ourselves. Um, so we said, okay, this 20 billion will be assessed on large financial institutions that have 50 billion or more in assets. And to our shock, the Republican, the three Republican senators said, no, we, 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 we've done enough. We can't vote for higher taxes. And this assessment on the banks is a tax. So Senator Dodd called me and said, I got a problem. I don't have my 60 votes. We had to reconvene the conference and uh, take the burden of that assessment off the banks and put it on the taxpayers. Um, Senator Brown got hurt by that. That was one of the arguments Elizabeth Warren used against him. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Perhaps you solved too big to fail. How about too big to jail? Can we assume that in future situations where we have people who have, it looks like to many of us, acted very badly, that they're not going to go to jail and not be held account for what they did? I hope did? we have. I, I will plead a little bit of uh, uh, not, not my fault, because under the uh, way Congress works, we don't have criminal jurisdiction. Um, you know, we, we have civil jurisdiction, although it can be a, we, we did create things that would be crimes. Um, Two arguments against that. One, in somewhat defense of the prosecutors, part of the problem was that things that were clearly lousy weren't illegal. I mean, one part of this law was to make some things illegal that weren't. Beyond that, I can only say I share your view. I, I was disappointed that they did not prosecute more people, and I hope they will prosecute some of them in, in going forward. I understand the argument that you don't want to necessarily prosecute the whole bank and collapse it. Um, but banks don't do anything. Individuals in the banks do them. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree, and I'm not, I still don't know the answer why there weren't more individual prosecutions. Well, that, that leads me, too, to the fact that we've got an increasing populism, I think, in America. Occupy is certainly a very populist movement of the left. The Tea Party is a populist movement of the right. And one thing they actually agree upon is that they don't trust Wall Street, if you look at the data. Uh, and that's been typically true of populists. They don't trust big institutions, uh, although those on the left trust government a little bit more than those on the right. But certainly in terms of private industry, they don't like big business. Populism, though, is sometimes not clear on what the problem is. And it's sort of a, I'm unhappy. The big guys got off. They didn't get jailed. They were treated with kid gloves. How come I don't get anything? Is that a dangerous thing for America? Oh, it is. Um, I will tell you, I, I was never more worried about our ability to govern this country than in the uh, late winter of 2009 when it became public that AIG had paid bonuses to the very people who had caused this problem. And there was this white heat furor. And, and I am worried about it. I have to say, and you're right, that the, the right talks about this and the left talks about it as well. The left is, I, I disagree with some of their specifics, but at least they're coherent. Um, the right wing fulminates against Wall Street, but if we talk about raising taxes on uh, uh, this Dodge, I think it's a Dodge, where hedge fund people, um, they have something they call carried interest, and it's basically a profit they make that they treat as if it was a capital gain and get lower taxes, but the right wing supports them. So while, while the populists fulminate, um, the Tea Party people also, are, 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 I guess they say, well, big government's worse than big banks. And overwhelmingly, the Tea Party people vote against regulation. Um, but yeah, it is. So the biggest danger is they are, and I think some of the business community, which 
has been very supportive of the Republicans because they were so angry at what we did in regulating them in the financial community, are now worried about their attacks on the Federal Reserve. Um, when I came to Congress, it was considered sacrilege to criticize the Federal Reserve. I would differ with them on interest rates, and I was told, no, that's dangerous. Now we have uh, the right wing, I think, dangerously trying to undercut the Federal Reserve. And what's interesting- And you see this at Tea Party rallies, by the way. Absolutely. You see, actually, in Occupy, too. Both, again, Occupy and the Tea Party have concerns about the Federal Reserve. But the, uh, the difference is this. The Tea Party is effective. Okay. People in Occupy go and have marches. In fact, there is no Occupy anymore. I mean, one of my regrets, frankly, as a liberal, is that uh, Occupy never got nearly as politically effective as the Tea Party. But the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve has done what they call quantitative easing, buying bonds from the economy to, in effect, expand the amount of money available despite right-wing predictions, that has been very helpful. It's one of the reasons why America is the best economic performance in the developed world, but this is being attacked. I mean, here's the deal. If it looks as if the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates and stop this, go out of the quantitative easing business, not raise interest rates, but even stop selling bonds, the stock market goes down. So the Tea Party, the tea party cheers if that were to happen, but the finance community hates it. And I think this is uh, an issue that the business community has to deal with, because if the Tea Party ever were to take total control, if you got a Tea Party, a pro Tea Party president, House and Senate, you would have a serious negative impact on the Federal Reserve. I think bad for the country, and it's one of the things that's playing out politically. Why do we need Professor Gober, the Federal Reserve? Why can't we go back to the gold standard or uh, self-regulating markets? Why do we need this institution? Well, the Federal Reserve's monetary policy helps stabilize the economy. So as Congressman Frank uh, said, I think the Federal Reserve played an enormous role in stabilizing the economy, for example, during the financial crisis, expanding its balance sheet tremendously, um, providing you know, a lot of capital, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, keeping, keeping interest rates low, I think has been very important. If you look at the, as Congressman Frank, I think, alluded to, if you look at the performance of other developed economies around the world, it's really a stark difference between how the United States has done versus how, let's say, Europe has done um, in the days since the financial crisis. So that's a good example of how the Federal Reserve has been effective in um, what's called countercyclical uh, monetary policy, you know, sort of leaning against the wind. And when there's a crisis, uh, uh, you know, lowering interest rates, trying to stimulate the economy when the economy is overheating, trying to pull back a little bit. The Federal Reserve also does many other things like banking regulation that helps stabilize the economy. Um, and, uh, and so the Federal Reserve plays an extremely important role in financial stability and in regulation. Um, and so uh, I am in complete agreement that the Tea Party efforts and the, the skepticism of the Federal Reserve are extremely counterproductive and, in fact, extremely dangerous for the United States economy. Where do economists in general, I mean, we, could you say something like 90 percent of economists think the Federal Reserve is a great idea or 99 percent or what, what's the? I would agree that it's an overwhelming majority of, of serious economists. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it, you would be hard pressed to find a serious economist who would disagree. Let me just talk about one point here. Ben Bernanke, who became the symbol of their patron, et cetera, was a Republican academic economist at Princeton who was first appointed by George W. Bush to be uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, no, he was appointed to be a governor of the Federal Reserve. Then Bush made him chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Then he made him chairman of the Federal Reserve. Ben Bernanke is a three-time Bush appointee. This is not some radical uh, who, who came in here. And yeah, there was an overwhelming economic consensus about this. There was some difference about exactly what the Fed should do. But, and it started out with some people being skeptical of what's called quantitative easing. At this point, there's an overwhelming economic consensus that it has worked. Some people say, okay, now it's time to stop it. Uh, the other thing is that, as Professor Gelber said, America's economic performance has been much better than the rest of the world. And in part because of that, the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan are now emulating the Federal Reserve. And they are implementing precisely the policies in the, in, in the European Eurozone and Japan that conservatives said we're gonna wreck America. They work so well in America, they're now one of our big intellectual exports. And it's, it's sad because they're several years late. The United States was trying to 
you know, push for more expansionary policy around the world, and it has really hurt both the countries around the world and even the United States through, you know, international financial market channels and, and, uh, and, and international finance. So uh, it's really sad that, uh, that they had to wait to get into even more dire straits before uh, following our lead, in my opinion. So let me change the subject to Barack Obama. Top quarter of our presidents, middle half, bottom quarter. I have to say this. I, uh, I'm a, I resist rating presidents about how good or bad they were because I rate presidents on the substantive nature of their policies. I mean, I, you know, a, a very effective conservative to me is worse than a sort of moderately effective liberal. In fact, if I disagree with someone's ideology, I don't want them to be very effective. Um, I do think that uh, Barack Obama, having said that, Looks, looks good. The 2009-2010 congressional session, when we, for the first time since Bill Clinton's first two years, had a Democratic House, Senate, and President, has one of the best legislative records in American history. We got health care. We got financial reform. We repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We passed the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which strengthens the right of women to sue for uh, job discrimination. And Professor Gelber will know this better than I, although he wasn't there when it happened. But the, the, it's to the Treasury Department. We passed a very important little known law that strengthens our hand in getting people who are trying to evade taxes overseas and work together. And, and, and we have substantially, not entirely, reduced uh, the tax evasion. Um, in the international area, I think he has been, again, doing the right thing. Um, it took some political, he took some political heat for withdrawing from Afghanistan and Iraq in particular. Clearly the right thing to do. We are better off for his having done it. Um, I uh, think his policies are now being vindicated even with regard to those terrible butchers of the Islamic State. He refused to send American troops in despite pressure to do that. But he has used air power very successfully. And the Islamic State is now, people may not remember six months ago how they were on the verge of winning everything. And they have been driven back substantially because American air power has been so effectively deployed. And then, of course, in some areas on uh, LGBT rights, uh, he's been very, very helpful and important. And in the environment, hindered as he is by a Republican party that's gotten very conservative and denies that climate change is an issue, uh, he's been able to make some progress. So you said you didn't want to rate the president, but you did just say there's a lot of things he's accomplished. Would you say then he's towards the top in terms of accomplishments as a president? Well, he's been a very effective uh, advocate, advocate of policies that I like, yeah. I think that was, uh, uh, that's one of the things I give him credit for. Now again, you always, you know, he, he's, he was able to accomplish more than President Carter, mm -hmm. a very decent man, but, but I think he, 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 he did better. In fact, he's been unfairly uh, criticized. Oh, why didn't he do what Lyndon Johnson was able to do? Well, Lyndon Johnson was a spectacularly successful president with the Congress for a couple of years. Uh, and it's probably, he can thank Barry Goldwater for that, because the Republicans nominated Barry Goldwater in 1964. He was off the charts to the right. The result was an overwhelmingly Democratic Congress that passed all this important legislation. There was also the impetus that came from the murder of, of John Kennedy, the tragedy that had at least that uh, good effect. But by 19, after the 1966 election, when the Republicans made gains, 67 and 68, President Johnson wasn't able to do very much. There's a very real limit to what any president can do with a hostile Congress. So what do you feel is left undone that you wish that you had another career uh, to expend on getting it done? I would like to continue the work I try to do on, on affordable rental housing. I think people uh, misunderstand that. For example, in the education area, I'm very sympathetic to teachers who say, you know, here's the problem. Kids come to school, young kids, who live in terrible situations. They don't have a good night's sleep because there's nowhere to sleep. If they wanted to study, there'd be nowhere to study. Um, I really do believe that children who live in, in terrible homes are very hard to teach. I, 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 there's no excuse, and, and for homelessness, there's no excuse for there not being uh, decent housing uh, for everybody. Beyond that, I would like very much, if I had the power to pass legislation, that would uh, restore some strength to labor unions. I think there is a very clear correlation between the success the right wing has had in attacking labor unions, both in the public, but even more in the private sector, and the uh, increase in wage inequality and, and economic inequality. I would, I would put a high, uh, 
I uh, put a lot of effort in, in, into that. Um, I also believe we should do a great deal for the long term in dealing with inequality to uh, make it a lot less expensive for, for people who aren't rich to go to college, not just community college, but college in general. So I'm the dean of a public policy school. What would you tell our public policy students about becoming an elected official, working in government? What would your pitch be? If you think that government should change its policies, then it is the best way to do that. Um, because you do have that kind of, 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 uh, of, of power. I would say, uh, in terms of, I, I have one, one point is, I think uh, it is important to come equipped to fight. The one counterintuitive thing I think I say to many, counterintuitive because it's not what everybody wants to do, please take a lot of accounting. About 50% of the debates we have are over people's either misusing or, or refusing to use uh, accounting. But the other thing, I, it's inherent in what I so said. So numbers matter. Very much. Makes, makes me happy. And, and the misuse of numbers by others is, yeah. is very important. The other issue is, um, uh, I talked about Occupy and the Tea Party. I think the American political system responds much better to informed, disciplined public input than many of my friends on the left like to say. But the problem is that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have two kinds of voter suppression in America. We have voter suppression that comes from the right, which is conscious and legal and outrageous and puts legal obstacles in the way of people voting. But from the left, we have this drum fire of argument that says voting's a waste of time, that there are no good politicians, they're all bums. What's the difference? Big money dominates everything. They may not fully believe that, but they find it useful to use the rhetoric. But a lot of other people who may not be as sophisticated, if you hear that rhetoric, if you're told it doesn't make any difference, they're all in the pockets of rich people, they won't listen to you, why would you try? And I think that, that, that has a depressing effect. And your history is that you did actually take on some of those rich, powerful interests and? Elizabeth Warren, the day that the committee I chaired voted out, and I said we did separate votes, we had a vote on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And one of the highlights of my career was standing next to Elizabeth Warren when she said, they told me not even to try this because the banks always win, but they didn't win today. They didn't win, by the way, because the financial crisis so agitated the general public that they weighed in. The problem is that, uh, and here's what I hope the danger is, that the complications of this and the things, we don't know the crisis, the public will stop paying attention. The large financial institutions will continue to pay attention, and that, that's the path for them to erode it. Great, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Professor Gelber of the Goldman School, uh, Representative Barney Frank, uh, retired from Massachusetts. Thank you.